Let's, uh, let's start with just tell me what it's been like coming out from Oklahoma and kind of getting situated here at AKA and California on top of that. Dude, it was a hard transition at first. It was, uh, had $600 to my name. It didn't make any sense coming out here. It doesn't make, that doesn't last long out here, no. that's for sure. Committed to $1,000 in rent. Yeah. And, you know, everyone told me no. Mom, dad, doesn't make sense. <clears throat> it did to me, you know. Came out here. I was a little scared. No one, I was coming off an L. I had a five and three record. And then just through time, dude, two years, just working my ass off. Now I'm getting the respect from everyone, you know? People people see the work ethic. I'm, I put everything together and I just kind of knew this lifestyle was for me. I didn't give myself another option. I didn't, I didn't want to work a job on top of training. I just wanted to train. I didn't know how it was going to be possible. I still don't know how I do it, but it's happening, you know? Yeah. It's cool. The leap of faith. The leap of faith changes everything. Yeah. You do that, all the external stuff follows. Speaking of that leap of faith, I got a, a kind of short story or short version from you, at least on kind of like how you got into fighting and you were telling me about, uh, you know, your first fight being 17 and having to kind of lie to get your way in and just tell me a little bit about, you know, just sticking with that leap of faith theme and just like where your mentality was at getting started there. It was just... I've always grown up a wrestler. I think it instilled the mindset of like tenacity and resilience. Mm -hmm. And I've always been headstrong. If I wanted something, I'd get it. And it didn't matter what it took. And I was serving tables, doing stuff like that, wanting to be a fighter, went to college, trying to have this pro fight career. And I expected more, you know? Uh, so I took that, like, that leap of faith, right? And I just knew what I wanted for myself. And I knew I was willing to do whatever I had to do to create it. If it was move across the country, broke. And it had all started that night when I was 17, when I felt that. We all do this, there's like a three second feeling you get after you win. A it's, three second feeling? I, I, I break it down to that, I think. I'd say it's, I'll say five, second, five seconds of just, when you're by yourself in the cage, you win. Say you knock him out, it's just, mm -hmm. ah, like, there it is weeks and weeks of preparation. Most, most athletes, they're getting stipends per week, right? Yeah. We don't get paid until we get to that fight and we win. And because of that, a lot of times, that's not why we do it. If, if the money was why we did it, we wouldn't be in it, you know? That comes later. So it's just that once I felt that when I was 17, I knew I was gonna chase that for the rest of my life. Yeah. That's, uh, I mean, the money thing is like, uh, it leads people down the wrong path far too often. You see that out here in the Bay Area, you know, with probably 90% of the people that you run across. And, um, but, you know, connecting to like what your purpose is and what your meaning to your life and what you're trying to be here about, you know, those are the things, those are the tough decisions that you end up having to move across the country with $600 in your pocket and, you know, not yeah. know how you're going to like pay rent or where you're going to live but it doesn't matter because you know what you want to do, you know, and then the money, everything else kind of like falls into place. So tell me a little bit about uh, being at AKA, man, you know, like one of the top gyms in the world for MMA and just like the support system you have and the people you get to train with on a daily basis. Yeah, dude, the, the team, the, the energy here, it's unbelievable. There's not a gym like this in the world. Not only, I mean, we have DC and Habib in camp right now, so the energy's electric here. Mm -hmm. But when you're around guys like that, and you know, all these UFC fighters, when I was living at home, it was like, I would see guys like that, and it was like, oh, they're superstars. But you come out here, and those are just my friends, you know, those are training partners, they're teammates, I see them every day. That does something to your psychologically. It does mm -hmm. something. It changes how you view people. When, when you're sparring with Habib and then you go fight some low level UFC guy, they're nobody anymore, right? So this place humanizes everyone. It did for me. It, it showed me that everyone's human. They all wake up, they all put their pants on the same, they're, they're sore, they're tired. That changed everything for me. Um, obviously, the, the physical when you're training with the best of the best you see the results but I think psychologically and mentally when you're around those type of guys and you're pushing next to them and 
that changes. That's when you start seeing the big changes, for me at least. Yeah, it's almost like you get a, you, it's a level up, you know? And like sometimes you gotta, for a lot of people I would imagine, especially people who aren't in gyms like this, they gotta fight somebody that's kind of like on the caliber of what you were talking about to level up, right? You know, like Yeah, you, and the you, first time they see it, see the first time they see that, even, even entry level UFC guy, we'll take an entry level UFC guy, tough guy, right? The first time they see that is in the cage. Out here, I mean, we're, we're training with higher caliber every day, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's so huge because I'm not trying to learn lessons on the job. I'm trying to <laughs> learn my lessons in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a dangerous occupation, yeah. right, to, to learn. Yeah, shit. But, uh, I mean, I think that's uh, back to what you were saying about just this place humanizing um, everyone. You know, I mean, that's a how valuable of an asset is that to right. be able to just kind of like level up on an everyday basis with where you train at, you know, and you yeah. get to have those those learning experiences, you know, daily. off the clock, yeah. <laughs> yeah, off daily, the clock. off the clock, <laughs> when the paychecks don't matter. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's cool, man. This place does change lives. Yeah, I bet. I mean, I don't um, obviously train in the capacity that you do, but just like the, the energy that you were speaking of, I mean, like when I literally like first walked in here, it's palpable, you know, yeah. I and mean, you can taste it. And like everyone that's been, you know, here before you, you know, they've left a little bit, a little bit behind, you know. See, that's that. the thing also is I was talking with DC about it, you know, for him and Kane and Luke, they kind of left the blueprint for us. I mean, we, the gym, this gym is so tradition rich, right? They had like strike force champs. They had like John Fitch, Josh Thompson, people knocking at the UFC belt. But once, I mean, we had three guys have the belt at the same time, you know? Mm -hmm. Coach Hobbs training all of them. Like that's the blueprint. They left the blueprint for us. So now this generation, my generation, we have so many up and comers and now, now we have the blueprint. This is what it takes. Right? They, they laid it out for us. So you buy in, I mean, your odds are looking good, right? Yeah. What's it like, uh, you know, speaking of Hav, what's it like just being able to, I just, you know, watch you hit mitts with them, you know, and getting that one-on-one that -on -one time. What's it like to be able to, to have that again, you know, just another resource? It's unbelievable. He's, I like that I have the older Hav. You know, okay. he's, I, I think he's like the Gandalf version, huh? Got he's, you. Yeah, he's yeah. older, he's wiser, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, he's healthy. He's holding mitts. He, having him on my head changed my life dramatically. Because as a kid, I've told the story, I told the story in the cage after my last fight, but as a kid, I would see Hoff and Bob cornering so many UFC guys, right? John mm -hmm. Fitch, Josh, Kane, Luke. I actually told my dad, I was like, man, I want to fight under them one day. And then uh, I tried to take myself back to it when I'm hitting mitts with him or something. Like, I dreamed of this, mm -hmm. you know? And now, now I got him on my head. And he always says it, you know, anyone can hold mitts, but he's a coach of the mind. Because this game's mental, you know? And there's not, I wouldn't rather have anyone on my head than Javier Mendez, personally. Cool. What do you, so, you know, this gym has a kind of a famous reputation for sparring hard, you know, and um, I, I, you know, some people critique that, you know, and think that, that it's uh, kind of like can lead to like some injury issues and things like that, and that, you know, going that hard isn't um, really necessary kind of to, de to develop your skill level, but going back to what you were talking about as far as like the blueprint and what's been left behind, like, what are your thoughts on that? I think, I used to hate sparring hard. Mm -hmm. I hated it, I avoided it before here and even when I first got here. But I think it's important because you learn to be controlled in the fire, right? Okay. You, when you walk to the cage room, you can, ask, you can ask the best of the best, DC, Habib, Kane. When you walk from the red room to the cage room, it's the same exact nerves as when mm. you walk to the cage or they say, hey, you're up. Mm -hmm. And not many gyms experience that. You know, a lot of gyms, what we do in the red room, the team sparring, is mm -hmm. harder than most gyms hard sparring. Mm -hmm. And that's cool, you're healthy, I get that, but we're healthy, you know? I mean, Coach Hav has this under control. If someone gets dropped, if someone gets hurt, 
ah, cut it, you're done for two weeks, you know, no sparring for two weeks. But when the going gets tough, we've been there. And that's what we do, you know, we take guys to deep waters, like, because we're in that room so often. So first round, that's cool. You can be all pretty. You can dance outside and stuff. But round two and three, if it's four and five, that's when the going gets tough. And you're not just going to be able to drill and touch, you know? So I think mentally going in that room, knowing that you're, you're tested, you're battle tested, you're ready, you're sharp. And not only that, the eyes you have on you. You're in there sparring. You're the same nerves as a fight, the body doesn't know whether you're in a fight or you're in sparring. The body mm -hmm. knows just the same nervous reaction. Yeah. So you're, you're in a fight, and then you have the eyes of Javier Mendez, Bob Cook, Ron Kessler, Rosendo Sanchez. I mean, we're talking the best of the best coaches, you know? DC will watch, Kane will watch. And then after you're sparring, good or bad, you, you're not always winning sparring rounds here, you know? Good or bad, you sit on the couch, and then you have input. Mm -hmm. Hey, this was good, you need to work on this. You need to work on this, I liked this. That's valuable, dude. You know, people would pay money for that right there. Yeah. And I think uh, I like to do a lot of journaling. After spar, when it's fresh, work the other side of the brain. Uh, I like to keep it positive, you know? Yeah. The inner dialogue is important in this sport. How do you talk to yourself and stuff? So it's important in life. In life, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's what I love about this sport is mm -hmm. it correlates to life so well. This sport make, has made me a better human, you know? It really has. It, it humbled me. It taught me respect. It taught me uh, self-respect um, so much, you know? You know, diving inside, because we were talking about money. You can't chase money. Yeah. Um, you dive inside. I do a lot of meditation. You meditate. You, you find the drive inside. doesn't matter what comes externally. The money, all that. It'll come once it's all handled inside, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%, especially with, uh, like, this, the, the things you learn transcending into just real life, you know, and like you were talking about navigating the fire when it comes to like sparring hard and how that translates into, you know, like your actual fights. And you know, that's like one of my favorite psychological concepts is just like the chaos and order, you know, and just like the not trying to like hide or run away from chaos, but like embracing it and then learning how to navigate it, you know? And yeah. so like when shit hits the fan, like you're not shook, you know, like you've already, you've been there, done that. And is it, is it fun? No, like, do you still have to kind of like, you know, like grit and get through it? Yeah. But do you have like a little bit more, you, you have that baseline knowledge of that you've done this, you've been here, you know, yep. so like that takes kind of some of the, the edge off of it, you know, and you Absolutely. can think a little bit clearer. And so, uh, yeah, man, a lot, I mean, a lot of what you're saying is, uh, you know, a lot of positive psychology to it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like you said, especially in a fight, you know, we're both in the fire. Mm -hmm. We're both right here. But I'm willing, I, I'm able to, I've been here. <sighs> All right, I relax, you know. I call it the dark place. I like to, when I get in a fight, what I think is I can't, I can't focus too much on like, oh, I want a jab. I want to hit a hard jab and land a clean cross. I don't care how I do it, but I want to take him to the dark place. I want to take him to the dark place. I want to take, we're both okay. going to the dark place, right? Okay. So my training, when, when I think I'm done, I, I'm broke. I'll go a little bit longer. When, we're, when I don't want to spar in the cage room, I'll go. Because it puts me in the dark place. I take ice baths because mm -hmm. I hate them. And it puts I me in the dark place. Yeah, you, you never get used to that shit. No, huh? it like, sucks just yeah, as much every ever, time. Ever, man, every single time. But you got to go to the dark place because mm -hmm. if I take a guy to the dark place, and energies are real, right? And especially in a fight, I can feel, you know? If I can feel he's not comfortable in the dark place, it could be I come out and crack him with a hard one too and I put pressure on, boom, he's already there. It could be mm -hmm. a minute left in the third round. The pace is just too much. I don't care when it happens, it's gonna happen. And you gotta, you gotta be able to dwell there, you know? You gotta be comfortable in there. You gotta be able to take a deep breath, smile at it, and say, here we are. Embrace it, right? Embrace it, embrace the suck. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, you know, you, so you've, you've obviously given a lot of insight into like, kind of like how you're training and stuff like that. And you've also touched on some of the things that you do as far as like meditation and journaling. 
uh, let me know a little bit more. I'm curious, at least, to kind of like know a little bit more about like how you journal, like specific to your fighting, what type of meditation you do, and then also just like what do you do? How do you like to recover? You know, like what do you do? So I like my journaling. I'll wake up and I'll just write a brief three to four sentences talking to so myself. So like right when you wake up in the morning? Yeah, wake up. Okay. I like to wake up, have a glass of water with some lemon and Himalayan salt because okay. I was reading, I think it was Aubrey Marcus, you know, when you sleep for eight hours, that's eight hours of no water. Oh, I read that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. Do this, so day, yeah. I was doing that. That's yeah. all drink in the morning yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I do that and when I do that, I journal mm -hmm. and I kind of talk to myself and then I set, I write three little marks whether it could be three tasks i want to accomplish for the day okay. it could three affirmations okay. three just whatever i'm feeling yeah and then i go through the day so spar and then i'll leave it blank and i'll write i'll come back and the input i get kind of go over mitzvah hoff Oh, so you'll over. set it up you, when you know you're doing something later in the day you'll kind of like set that up and then yep. come back to and it and then at the end another three to four sentence of reflection okay. i think that's important and i used to journal and i would like critique myself too much yeah. but journaling i feel like as a fighter we get so much criticism like constructive criticism it's still criticism you know yeah. we owe it to ourselves to be positive you know and that's that's where i give myself my my positivity my okay. i'm i'm proud of this i'm happy if i could go back and do it again though i would do this it's just how we word it mm -hmm. you know um yeah i do so i journal i i asked that because i journal too and um it took me like uh, it's been probably like three or four years now where i do it pretty consistently like on an everyday basis you know you miss a day or two yeah. here and there but um for like the first year like when i was journaling it was always like you know, I was, like, trying to, like, be cathartic by, like, kind of, like, getting my whining out on paper. You know what I'm yep. saying? Like, so all, like, the negative shit in my life, like, I would whine about it, like, on paper. And it took me, like, a year to, like, realize that I was just, like, like, creating, like, a victim mentality, you know, like, through that. And then, like, by changing just the terminology, like how we were saying earlier, from changing that to, like, making everything a positive thing. So, like, you know... Some, something shitty happens to you, right? Like, instead of, like, like, oh, wow, this happened to me. My car broke down or whatever. Like, I changed it into an opportunity, you know? It's like, exactly. oh, like, awesome. So, like, today I have the opportunity to, like, work through this conflict or, like, work through that. And just, like, that, uh, that specifically, like, with changing that terminology, like, it just, it clicked, man. It's powerful it, shit. It's very powerful. And it's, that has transcended into, like, all aspects of my life um, going forward with that. So what about meditation? What type of meditation do you like to do? So I'll, I mix it up. Sometimes I'll go to YouTube and type in 20 minute guided meditation on clarity, on okay. anything, you know, chakra balances. Yeah. But lately I've been into like the binaural beats, the brain waves. Those are dope, yeah. You know, so before mm -hmm. my, last, my last two fights actually, I mm -hmm. got into the brain waves. Okay. And when, they, when it was time to when it was time to, we got the hands wrapped and I first started shadow boxing, I threw on the beta brain waves, the fast frequency. Okay, because you can use them to go up or down, Yeah, right? so like you yeah. got the alpha, which is like the slow meditative state, yeah. and then the beta, gamma is the fastest like aha moment, but I like the beta, you know, it was, it's very focused, they say it's for sports performance, mm -hmm. and dude, both fights, it was like when I started warming up with my hand wraps on, listening to the, the brain waves. It was like my vision became in straws. Like hmm. I could see it. I was just so honed in. Hmm. I was so dialed in. And so all, you know, they have like miracle tones. They have healing tones. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of diving into that. Just meditations like anything else. You know, it's a journey. You start like. I'll do these guided meditations with Bob Proctor. Yeah. And then I'll go into these brain waves and then I'll go into chakras and just floating. Yeah, I mean, learning. so many people, uh, I mean, and I was included in this when I uh, first, again, because, like, I, I try to incorporate at least, you know, like, mindfulness or meditation, you know, like, into, like, my daily life. But, you know, I used to think that, like, meditation was about sitting Indian style right. like this, like, completely quiet, you know. And it's like the whole, like, stereotype of what you think of meditation. And then the more you, you know, experiment with it and the more you just do it, the more you realize 
taking a walk is meditation. You For know, sure. if there's like active meditations and things that you can do that are essentially just things that just kind of like regulate, you know, like your body and your emotions and can kind of like clear your head and give it a break from just like that. The grind Put the design, device right? away and hang out with your dog can be meditation. Hundred <laughs> percent, yeah, for sure. You know? man. Yeah. Put put all the the chaos and commotion and put that away. You owe it to yourself, I think. Everyone yeah. does, right? <laughs> Everyone does. Everyone man. does. Yeah, and it's something that uh, you know a lot of people take for granted. Never get that kind of personal time to just to ground back into hear the hear the voice in their head man uh, you know, yeah. especially this day and age where you know everyone's got their phone in their hands 24 7 you don't have five seconds where you're feeling bored right because if you do you're on your phone so overstimulated <laughs> it is no and no, some yeah. people never recover from that just no. go through their day constantly overstimulated 